let them stand with your hands down with us. Let's open in prayer this morning. Father, we are so grateful that you show up. That every time we look to you, you're right there. We just, Holy Spirit, we invite you into this room right now. We just ask that you would have your way, that you would be exalted, and we would see your face this morning.
got to spare us a sea out surely A victory dance I will dance out in fear We'll crush this appointment Crush this upon me. Yeah. Yeah. We bless you. We bless you, Lord. We thank you for this time, Lord. We just ask that you would just continue and just let your presence just stay here, Lord. Mm. The sweet, sweet presence. Just speak through Adam, Lord. Just bless the word that goes out. And speak through Bradley, too. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, before you sit down, say hello to someone next to you. Ask them what they did with the beautiful, sunny day we had yesterday. I didn't hear all of that. So I'm just going to say hi. hi. I'm Kim. Kim. All right, thank you. Well, hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Bradley. I'm the youth pastor here. We are so excited that you are here. Uh, I just wanted to tell you a couple of things. Well, first of all, I'm not only really excited that you're here, but we're also excited for all the people who are joining us online. Um, and so, hi, online people. Great. They didn't answer back, but I'm going to assume I didn't hear them, but they did. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, hey, uh, I just have a couple of quick announcements for you. The first one is that tonight at 6 p.m., the amazing Jordan Rosinski. Um, yeah, I should, I, sorry, I should have paused for the, the celebration when I said his name. Um, the amazing Jordan Rosinski will, um, will be teaching at Holy Spirit Night. And so Holy Spirit Nights, if you don't know, are an extended time of worship and ministry um, and some teaching. And so uh, you should come back this evening at 6 p.m. for that. And then in just a few short weeks after that, uh, on May 5th, Carolyn Yoder will be here. She's a good friend of the staff. And so Carolyn Yoder will be here for a Holy Spirit night on that night. So um, now would be a great time to take out your phone and go to the calendar um, and go to May 5th and just go ahead and put that in there. And then when you're in there, go ahead and turn that phone off so you're not tempted to use it while Adam is speaking. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, well, hey, I, you guys. On Wednesday night, right here in this room, we baptized nine or eight students. Eight students. That is awesome. Um, and if you if you have not seen the video of that, you should go check it out. It's on the youth group page, but I think also on the church page as well. And so, man, that is just so exciting. And I just want I just want to personally thank anyone who's given to this church to help make that happen. Yes, yeah, you guys, when you give to this church, you help make programs like our youth group happen. You make programs like kids ministry happen, um, and and serving our community and all of the things. And we are so thankful to be a community of people that get to extend the kingdom of God right here um, and in the communities around us. And so thank you so, so much. If you would like to give, there's a couple of ways that you can do that. You can scan that QR code on the back of the seat in front of you. Um, it'll take you to our website and you can give there. Although if you're connected to our public Wi-Fi, it's probably not working right now, so you might need to click that off. <laughs> I should have told you that. Then if you tried to use your phone during service, it wouldn't work. Ha ha! Gotcha! I'm just gonna start doing that every Sunday. Oh no! The Wi-Fi's down. <laughs> oh man. Um, anyways, you can give online. You can also, if you'd like to give, um, you know, with the the, the non technology way. There are boxes in the back of the room. <laughs> and you can give physical gifts there. There's even envelopes for you to put your information on and you can give that way. Well, um, I would like to introduce the one, the only, the Adam Waters who's continuing our series. Yeah. Yeah. Ready 9:30? Yes. 
We're having some good stuff today, I think. Uh, do you allow me to pray one more time and we'll, uh, we'll jump into this. Father, um, I love you and I'm so grateful for you. I'm grateful for what you've done in this series, Jesus. And as we celebrated your resurrection, uh, as we celebrated communion together, as we celebrated life change, eight baptisms on Wednesday, eight baptisms last Sunday, 16 baptisms, God. Amazing to see how stories are being rewritten in this church, Jesus, and we're so grateful for that. And I pray that today it would keep going. Hmm. Come Holy Spirit and keep it going. Amen. Amen. Hey, friends, uh, you know, one of my favorite stories that, uh, that I love to watch with my kids every year is actually called The Story, and it's the Christmas story told through the eyes and the lenses of the animals at the nativity, okay? And so you kind of get their picture of how the story might have happened, the birth of Jesus and things like that. So I want you to, to picture with me um, the nativity here this morning, and I want you to think, um, as they are going through their brains, uh, you got to have a little imagination with me, okay? Um, uh, as, as you're going through the brains of each of the animals, like, what are they thinking about in terms of how they're going to get involved in Jesus' life? Okay, so picture with me just for a second. Some things will be easier than others. First of all, the camel. I will bless him by bearing him gifts. Makes sense? Bringing the gifts at the birth. The donkey. I will bless him by carrying him when he needs me to. Think triumphal entry, right? The cow. I will quench his thirst with my milk. The fish. I will help pay his taxes. If you guys don't know that story, sometime later in life, him and Peter go fishing and they get their taxes out of the fish's mouth. The dove. I will bless him at his baptism. Make sense, right? The duck, I will feed him. The sheep, I will warm him with my wool. And finally, the pig. I will let him fill me with demons, and then I'll go jump off a cliff, and we'll all die. <laughs> Some of you got that joke. Some of you will get it here in a minute. <laughs> all right, uh, we need to start there, because today we're going to talk about a subject that a lot of people get nervous around, or maybe have a little bit of a hard time with, and that is... The idea that Jesus doesn't just repair the sin problem, Jesus isn't just the repairman of our story, but Jesus is the repairman of everything going on in our lives. That he wants to come in and do work within our lives in every area. And some of those things are things that, that we've done or have been done to us, right? Some darknesses, some afflictions that maybe somebody has caused in our life or that we've caused ourselves, or that we've even been influenced upon in the spiritual realm. And maybe sometimes you don't think about those things. But Jesus actually comes as the repairman to have power over all of our darkness and all of our deepest hurts. Now, that's a big subject, I realize. And so this is a discussion that I hope that as we jump into, it'll start to make sense um, why we're, we're tackling this on this week. But Jesus, as the repairman, has power over all of our darkness and all of our deepest hurts. Not just the stuff that's on the surface level, but he likes to go all the way deep with us sometimes. And before we jump into the, this idea, it is really important that we understand a couple of things that as a church we believe, that our, our team believes, that, that we'll always preach from these places before we get into a, an important subject like this. And the first one is this. Um, we believe that good and evil are both real. Yeah. We, we believe that good and evil are both real. Uh, and you're, we're going to see that in some of the stories I'll tell later, but good and evil are both real. What good and evil are not, are not on the same playing field. Yeah. This is really, really important because a lot of us have been told that they're the two sides of the same coin. Or that darkness and light are, are equally powerful. I mean, that's the entire thing of like Star Wars, right? Like, is darkness and light are equally powerful. Or maybe you believe in the yin and the yang or karma. We do not believe that here. We do not believe that darkness has the same power that light does. That evil has the same power that good does. And we don't believe that because of a very simple truth. And that is that Jesus has already conquered darkness. All right, so Revelation 12 says these words. It's really important for us. There was a war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. Now, this is important because I want you to hear something. Jesus didn't even go to the battle. <laughs> He's like, I don't even need to. My angels are strong enough for the enemy. So this is important for you. All right, but the dragon was not strong enough for Michael and his angels, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. So we get to, so you know who we're talking about here. There's no, like, misstep, right? The enemy has been thrown out of heaven, and now he leaves the whole world astray. He's thrown to the earth and his angels with him. We believe in good and evil, yes, but they are not two sides of the same coin. The enemy has already lost. Right. 
In fact, verse 11 of the same chapter says that they lost at the blood of the Lamb. When the blood of the Lamb was shed, he was hurled down and everything has been destroyed. We're not waiting for an enemy to be thrown out of heaven again someday. This has already taken place. Amen. The victory is already won. Amen. Okay, that's really important when we talk about Jesus healing our darkness and our inner hurts. Because if you think that there's something just as powerful as Jesus in your life, you're going to struggle. Okay. We believe, number two, we believe that good and evil are both real as a church. We also believe this. Just because you've become desensitized to the spiritual battle, it doesn't mean it has not affected you. Okay. Just because you become desensitized to the spiritual battle doesn't mean it has not affected you. There is still a spiritual battle. I, we like to illustrate it this way. Um, in World War II, when we wanted D-Day... The, the, the war in and of itself, that was the, the breaking of the back of the enemy in World War II at D-Day. And yet, we lost more soldiers after D-Day before VE Day several years later. So there was still a battle going on even though the war had been won. And that's really important for us because we realize that the cross, the victory is secure, the victory has happened, and yet there's still a battle happening. If you go back to that, that last thing I just read, the, the enemy was hurled to the earth, right? So where is he at now? Yeah. He's here, and he's like a wounded animal, and he's not very happy with those of us who follow Jesus. Uh, Peter says it this way, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Because he doesn't like us. Because the authority that he once has has been given over to God's children. Yes, we believe there's good and evil, but some of us become actually desensitized to the reality that there's still a spiritual battle happening in our lives. And how does the enemy come at us? He comes at us in many different ways. He comes at us sometimes through what we watch and what we listen to. And Jesus talks about the eyes being the lamp of the body, right? What are you letting into your mind that could desensitize you to good and evil, to what the enemy is trying to do in your life? Sometimes it's through false narratives or lies about ourselves or about other people that causes relational discord. Sometimes it's through false narratives and lies about how we believe who God is and what he's able to do and what he's still doing in our lives. But I think it comes at us a lot, he comes at us a lot of ways in the Western world in this very simple truth. He says, oh, you're too smart to believe that stuff. You're too smart to believe there's still a spiritual battle. I mean, we've been educated beyond a spiritual battle. And then we get numb to the reality that there is still a spiritual battle going on. And the spiritual battle is something that we cannot be desensitized to if we want to be free, which is what we just sang about. Freedom comes when we realize the battle is going to be won and we continue to have more and more victory over the enemy. So there are lots of stories in our New Testament that talk about Jesus' interaction with the spiritual realm. In fact, if you read your Gospels at all, uh, maybe some of you uh, have been in our yearly Bible reading, we just got done with like an entire Gospel. Like, Jesus is always in a spiritual battle, isn't he? Right. Yeah. And we're to emulate his life. You ever thought about that? <laughs> so we should look at the stories of Jesus in a spiritual battle and go, this is what I have the ability to do, and sometimes maybe what I'll see in my normal life. Yeah. And so let's read a story about how Jesus repairs the whole person, both on the inside and on the outside. He, he repairs the whole person. He's not just dealing with surface level stuff. He goes all the way deep and repairs somebody from the inside out. And it's a dramatic story um, taken out of Mark chapter 5. But I want to read it um, quickly so that we get an idea of just how interesting Jesus' life was. <laughs> and maybe how interesting our lives could become. <laughs> okay, uh, Mark chapter 5. They went across the lake uh, to the region of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came out of the tombs to meet him. Okay? Anybody else freaked out already? Like some of you are just like, I don't even want to talk about this. So it's weird to think that somebody with an impure spirit says, okay, let's go have a conversation. All right. The man lived in the tombs, okay? And no one could bind him anymore, not even with the chain. So he's clearly crazy enough that we're trying to just tie him up and leave him in the tombs. For he had often been chained, okay, by hand and foot, and he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet, and no one was strong enough to subdue the man. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Quite the picture, isn't it? Is this getting dramatic enough for you yet? When Jesus saw, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran, fell at his feet in front of him, on his knees, excuse me, in front of him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God, in God's name, don't torture me? For Jesus had said to him, Come out of the man, you impure spirit. 
And Jesus asked him, what's your name? He says, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out into the area. And a large herd of pigs, this is our joke earlier, was feeding on the nearby hillside. And the demons begged Jesus, send us into the pigs and allow us to go into the pigs. And he gave him permission. And the impure spirits came out of the man, went into the pigs, and the herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank and into the lake, and they were drowned. And the pig fulfilled his destiny. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's dramatic, right? A, a crazy guy comes out of the tombs who cuts himself, who runs around unchanged, unbettered. Uh, one translate, uh, some translations, and it's in three of the Gospels, actually says that he's naked. You know, I mean, it's a crazy scene, right? Dramatic. And all those kinds of things. And we, we read something like this, and I think some of us go, okay, this is what spiritual battle looks like, and nope. We just go, no, right? I don't want anything to do with that kind of a thing. Well, let's talk about some things that are both normal and abnormal in this story. First, let's talk with the abnormal. This is the stuff that doesn't normally happen. Most of the time, the enemy is a whole lot more subtle than this. Yes. Most of the time, he hasn't so ravished and destroyed somebody's life that it's ended up like this. Most of the time... The release of darkness, inner healing, the, the release of spiritual attack on somebody is very, very subtle. And in fact, they may not even know what's going on in their life. And then secondly, this is the end of the story, not the beginning. This is the end of his freedom, right? This is when he finally gets free. This isn't his first encounter with freedom. And this is probably not his first encounter even with the religious beliefs of the day. This is actually the end of the story. Uh, think about it this way. Um, no one walks into a party as a teenager and goes, I want to be an alcoholic, right? <laughs> but they try a drink, and they try another drink, and sometimes somebody becomes an alcoholic because they've chosen little choices over and over and over again to get to a place where they need freedom from alcohol. Or nobody walks into a situation and says, I want to be a drug addict. And yet they try, you know, something small like marijuana, and it's a gateway drug to bigger drugs, and eventually you do become a drug addict. See, the thing is, this man made probably many, many, many small choices in his life to say yes to things that were spiritually bad for him, and eventually the enemy won in his life. And that's what happens. So the abnormalcy of this is we're seeing it at the end. We're not seeing it at the beginning. And yet I want to submit to you, the spiritual attack happened the first time he made one of those small choices. So what is normal? Well, first, when Jesus encounters the enemy, he responds. When Jesus encounters the enemy, the enemy responds to Jesus. I, I can remember one time I was taking my son to, to a JFL football practice, um, and I was in the park, and uh, I dropped Zeke off, and they were getting started. And as I'm walking back, um, there was a homeless man there that was talking to a, a broken phone. It was literally like broken in half, and the screen was removed, all this kind of stuff. So he was not talking to anybody. Okay? Black screen, all those kind of things. He was talking uh, in a weird voice to a broken phone. And I went to pray for the man. He goes, get away from me. Attack, attack, attack. Jesus is here. <laughs> okay? So I want you guys to understand something. That the enemy responds to Jesus. And he responds to the Jesus in you. Because when Jesus comes and lives in you, the enemy will respond. That's how you know you're sometimes in a spiritual battle. The enemy will recognize the Jesus in you. So that's the part that's normal in this story. Secondly, when Jesus encounters the broken places in you, you respond. And you respond in one of two ways. Ever get this feeling in the middle of a sermon or a worship service where I've got to get out of here? I gotta go to the bathroom. I gotta go to my car. Oh, I forgot that thing over there. Oh, I'm thinking about this over there. I really, I can't sit here still anymore. You don't have ADHD. The enemy that has gotten a foothold somewhere in your life is actually responding to you need to stay put and hear what the Father wants to do in your life at that moment. And what's going on in you can respond that way or some other way. Have you ever been in a worship service where, or just use worship service as an example, but you're in a worship service where you started crying, you're like, why am I crying? That's the same thing. That's the healing power of God coming on your life in the middle of a worship moment. Or you feel joy, you feel like I've got to dance, or I can't stop smiling, or I'm just overwhelmed by peace. See, there's, there's two things that are going to happen, but when you have stuff going on in your life, when you encounter Jesus, you're either going to want to run away from that moment with Jesus, or your body and your mind and your heart and your spirit is going to go yes to what Jesus is doing. 
And then thirdly, the other part, thinking it's normal, when others see the change in a person, they get uncomfortable. Listen to this next verse. It's, it's right there at the end of the story. When the people, the townspeople, came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion and demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And it actually says they begged Jesus to leave the region. You get out of here. Ever notice this when you see a big change in somebody? Sometimes it makes us uncomfortable. Can they really have said yes to the Holy Spirit, to Jesus, and impact in their life? When God does something impossible, which is what we just sang about, people get nervous about that. Some people get nervous about it because there's still stuff going on in their own lives, and they're like, I don't want to be that free. <laughs> Ooh, if they can get free, that means I have to get free of my stuff too. Which is where I want to go in the last part of this message. Some of us in this room need freedom right now. And some of you are Christians for a very long time and need freedom right now. You may have made partnerships or covenants or, or, or agreements with things in your life that are spiritually bad for you. And it's left us in places where we actually have some cobwebs that need cleaned out. Let me try to illustrate it this way. Every April, um, I go out and do a deep clean of my garage, and it needs it right now. <laughs> Maybe some of you else you do this. I, I pull every toy out of every corner. I pull every tool out of every corner and kind of move it all to the front of the garage or even outside into the driveway, and I get every nook and cranny. And I go, you know, I didn't mean for there to be grass behind that toolbox, but there's grass behind that toolbox. I didn't mean for there to be dog food behind that bucket of, of balls, but there's a bunch of dog food back there for some reason. I didn't want there to be cobwebs behind the fishing equipment we haven't used for two years, but guess what? There's cobwebs behind and, and some of us, that's what we need to do in our spiritual lives. We need to pull everything out and let Jesus do some work. Did I, do I want my garage to look that way? Of course not. But either through neglect or just not paying attention, right? It's gotten some messy spots. And that happens in our lives in many different ways. This is not an exhaustive list, but it's a list that, that um, was written years and years ago by, by a famous pastor. Um, and, and let me just give you real quick. And hear me on this before I read this list. Uh, these things don't negate the work of Jesus in your life, right? But if you don't choose freedom from these things, you'll find yourself bound up again. Yeah. Even after you said yes to it. So, first, unresolved anger. This is probably the one I've seen the most in people's lives. Self-hatred, hatred of others, words you've spoken over yourself, even all the way to self-mutilization. Hatred of someone else, desire for revenge. We want karma to happen and it may not. Unforgiveness is probably the one I've seen the most. And that's where unresolved anger really builds up and really can hurt our inner life. Sexual sin can, can open up the door for the enemy through pornography, lust, extreme perversion outside of God's idea for marriage, partnering with demons in some form of perversion. It can happen. The practice of false religions and the occult, whether through just watching it on a movie you know, we have a rule in our house. If a horror movie comes on as a commercial, we change the channel. We don't want that stuff in our house. It's a gateway for the enemy to have a foothold in your life. You come through books, through movies. Um, some of you may not even know this is a thing, but like we had in our own family, uh, Corey and I both had, had uh, relatives that were part of the Masonic Temple, and there's a bunch of demonic stuff there that needs to be broken off of your life. Family history, the things that they did or the things that they tolerated, the environment that you grew up in, you just assume, well, my life has to be this way because my family's life was this way. Even things that your family spoke over your life can give the enemy a place to just create a cobweb and some dirt in your life. And what I want you to hear is this, is we need to get serious about realizing that you can accept freedom in Jesus Christ, but if you don't fill your life back up with other things, that gives the enemy a chance to come back yeah. and do some work. 
When you fill our lives with God's identity of who we are and whose we are and with his purposes and his freedoms and, and fill our lives with his scripture and his music and his life and his community. When we fill our lives back up with that stuff, it doesn't give him a chance to come back. But when we leave the door open, it leaves the door open for some crazy stuff to happen. Listen to this text out of Matthew 12 that Jesus says. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, when a person goes free, it goes out, out and seeks rest and can't find it. This says, I'm going to return to the house I left. And if it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order, then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go live there. And the final condition of the person is worse than the first. Maybe you've experienced this. You, you, you gave your life to Jesus. You had an amazing moment of prayer. You got baptized. And like life was awesome for a very short amount of time. And then a few weeks later or even a year later, you're like, why am I back in all the same struggles? Why am I so bound up and almost feels worse than before? It's because you didn't fill your life back in with good stuff. You didn't back fill your life with good stuff. And you left the door open for the enemy to come and do more in your life. You actually opened the door up for... That darkness and that spiritual attack that you thought wasn't real to do something to you. That's crazy thought process. But let me read one more scripture that may help us with this. In Mark 16, it says, After Jesus rose from the dead early on Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene. That's the Easter story, right? The woman for whom had how many demons cast out? Seven. I want to submit to you that Mary Magdalene was somebody that was free and didn't fill her life back in with the stuff of Jesus. And they got bound up again. I want to submit to you that this guy among the tombs probably got free and then filled his life back up with so many bad things afterwards that he got more and more bound up. If your life is squeezed, will we get Jesus? <laughs> right? If you squeeze an orange juice, you should get, or an orange, you should get orange juice, right? If you squeeze a Christian, you should get Jesus, but sometimes we don't, right? <laughs> sometimes we get something else because we didn't fill our lives with Jesus. And what I want you to hear is this. One hurt, one oppression, one demonic attack. It's enough. Yeah. <laughs> That's enough to derail my life. I'm being is for you too, right? Like one spiritual battle is enough for me. But if I don't fill my life back with the stuff of Jesus, I'm opening myself back up to at least seven more attacks. Wow. So let's not have that happen. <laughs> let's all get free today. <laughs> Some of us need a fresh garage cleaning today. Some of us need just a fresh focus on filling our lives with the stuff of Jesus. Some of us just need to let the repairman do some work and stop holding on so tightly because freedom is a choice. Freedom is a choice. I let Jesus clean me, but I gotta let him fill me back to overflowing with his Holy Spirit because I still need to hang on to some of that stuff that I really like. <laughs> freedom is a choice, friends. Freedom is something that we have to go... I want you, Jesus, to fill every part of my garage. Not just sit there in the middle and be the most important thing. I want you to get every single nook and cranny. So that nothing else can come against me. And church, we need to know this. That as the body of believers, we as free people, we go and free people. Free people are to go and free other people. Jesus sends out the 12, he sends out the 72, he sends out all 500 disciples at the ascension, he sends out, sends out the new church. I know I have personally felt sent out, many of you in this room felt sent out to do what? To free other people. To bring the freedom we have received and, and go into somebody else's life and, and free them up. Give them the freedom that Jesus wants so badly for them. And this isn't just a one time we become saved moment. I'm talking about people that are bound up that have already said yes to Jesus too. So we need to be ready, not weird. That's really important. <laughs> so you notice the, the guy was weird enough, right? In Jesus' story, Jesus is pretty simple. Come out. <laughs> right? He said like one sentence. Yeah. We don't need to be weird. We don't need to shout. We don't do any other things. We just need to realize that if we're going to be free people, that free people, freedom's going to come at a time when we least expect it to happen. Right? It's going to come at a time when I didn't, I didn't make space for this today. <laughs> I didn't make space. Yeah, Jesus, if you know the precursor to that story, he was like going on vacation when this happened. <laughs> he actually was leaving his country to go do something else and rest. And this is and so it happens at weird times, and it'll happen when the person chooses to walk into it. Yeah. Right? 
When the person says, I want to be free. I want to be free of my stuff. And I want you to hear this. Sometimes it's subtle and it's not so obvious. Sometimes it's not the big dramatic moments. But be ready because sometimes it is. There was a moment at our last church in Urbana, which is a much larger church than this one, where we uh, we had somebody stationed at our connect corner, but it had like a nice desk that you sat behind, a big round desk. And um, uh, I had done announcements that morning and then went out and the person who was sitting behind the desk uh, needed to go to the restroom or something like that. And so I said, I'll sit behind the desk for a minute. And, and this woman comes up to me, college student, and she goes, hey, I need some prayer for my family and for some stuff going on with school. Awesome. I can do that. And there was a couple of chairs, you know, kind of behind the desk in this other room. I said, let's just go sit back here. And I went back and, and we sat down. She gives me kind of a couple sentences of what she wants to pray for. And I go, in Jesus' name. And she goes, stiff as a board, level in the middle of the ground, and drops the ground and starts writhing on the ground. That was the whole prayer, in Jesus' name. <laughs> this is important because I want you to realize I was working the connect desk at church, and my job was to tell people where the bathrooms were, right? <laughs> All right, so, so you're there. Was I on the prayer line? Yes. Nope. Was I in small group and circling up and praying? Nope. Was I on the street doing street evangelism? None of that. I was the, that's where the bathrooms are guy. And yet, not even finishing a prayer, and we had a long prayer session. I didn't finish it because I had to go back up and finish up my stuff on stage in the church. Where other people came in and prayed, and the family of God got around. That's why the family of God is so important, right? The family of God got around her and prayed for her and worked through some of her past history and the things she not let go of and the choices that she'd made and the covenants that she made and even some family stuff that her family had made covenants with. And they prayed until like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Because here's the deal. Sometimes we just want a little bit of prayer, and Jesus wants to go deep. And he wanted to go deep with her. And I want you to understand that for some of us today, I think Jesus wants to go deep. She had to choose to be free, and I think some of us today need to choose to be free. So let's stand. I want to invite the worship team up. And I want you to hear this from me. God just loves you like crazy. I think I've got the scripture from 1 Peter. Do I, I make that last slide this week? I couldn't remember if I did it. Oh, I did. Sweet. I put it as a maybe. <laughs> so, um, give all your worries and cares to God because He cares about you. That last part is so important. He cares about you. He cares about you. He loves you. He is a, a God who is just so interested in your freedom. He, he doesn't want you to have any cobwebs in your closet or in your, your garage or whatever makes sense, the, the, behind your fridge, right? He doesn't want any of that to be there. He wants you to be completely free and completely clean. And so I want to encourage you, as we worship today, begin to ask the Holy Spirit some questions. Go, okay, God, are there some things I still haven't given you yet? Are there some areas in my life I haven't fully gotten free from? <coughs> or are there some things that when I got free originally that I've let the enemy come back in and still have some influence on my life? Are there some places in my life, God, that aren't as full of you as they should be? And, I, and when we come back up and minister to one another after we sing this final worship song, I, I think this song is going to really minister to you. Actually, this song is going to really minister to you. Um, and I've let the Holy Spirit do some work in you even during this worship song. But when we do prayer at the end, I think some of you just need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. You're like, there's some spots that don't feel full of God. They still feel full of me or my life or my circumstances or, or whatever it might be. I think those are the places where maybe we get numb to the Holy Spirit wanting to do something. We get numb to the spiritual battle that's actually going on in our life. So Holy Spirit, as we sing today, as we worship and declare these truths over ourselves, I pray, Jesus, that you come and start the work now as we worship. And then when we, when we line up and pray for one another here at the end, Jesus, that you take it even one step further. That there will be some cleansing and some freedom and some cobwebs and some dirt and some dog food that gets cleaned out today, God. That, that maybe we didn't even know was there. Because you are a, a, a God who wants 
freedom in all of our lives so we can give all of our cares to you every single part that feels like it's not complete to you and you care about it and you love us through it so help us to minister to one another well today and do infinitely more than I can even imagine in this moment, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I'll be back in a little bit. Oh
situation's not breaking, I'm walking into a situation that might even be tough at work or at yeah. home, or maybe your home environment's not good, just speak the name of Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Because that will come out of you. Like Adam said, if you squeeze an orange, you should get orange juice. If you squeeze a Christian, you should get Jesus. Yeah. And you have that authority when you speak his name. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Speak the name of Jesus. And I, I also feel like there's some people in here that might be struggling with um, nightmares and dreams. Yeah and being attacked in your sleep. Yep. And so I encourage you to get prepared for that today, but one other thing that we love to do in our home, um, when our kids start, either we have some kids that have struggled with some night terrors and sleepwalking and things like that, we have actually gone through and prayed through our house. Yep. And so I encourage you, if there are things in your house, maybe you're just, there's, your house should be a place of peace. Right. When you walk into it, it should be a place of rest. And so if, if there are things where you walk in your house, you're like, it just doesn't feel peaceful in here, go into your house and take authority over that. Anoint your doors with oil. oil. It doesn't have to be a special oil. You can take your avocado oil, your olive oil, whatever you got in the house. Just walk through and pray over your house. Anoint your house with oil and speak the name of Jesus. And not only that for your family, but for everybody who comes into your house. Yep, and I, yep. Because then they're under your covering. Yep, and your authority through him. And so that's what I got. So, yeah. So let me close this in prayer and then invite you to come down and receive prayer yourselves. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, the name above every name, the name that every enemy, every spirit, every darkness, every bad choice must bow to that name. And so Jesus, we come with open arms to you because you're coming with open arms to us. I invite you into this prayer process. God, I believe there's going to be freedom for some. There's going to be encouragement for others. There's going to be a peace coming for some. There's going to be love like they've never felt coming for some. There's going to be an infilling of your spirit that they've never felt before. And I pray, Jesus, that as we minister to one another, we would know that you are the repairman coming in and doing the work. You are the special one. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on down for prayer. Come back and see us tonight for worship night. Uh, it's going to be a great day. Call 971.